Athleisure. Defined as a hybrid clothing style worn as athletic apparel, but can also be suitable for everyday wear. Rising to prominence as early as the mid-2000s, the growth of athleisure can be traced back to the rise of the yoga pants craze, when yoga pants went from exclusively being worn in the yoga studio to the grocery store and on the college campuses. This transition is what many, including myself, believe was when athleisure didn't just become a new and prominent fashion choice, but an entire movement in and of itself. A movement which spawned various new clothing brands ready to potentially capitalize and take the movement to another level. And the growth of this movement has undoubtedly had a lasting impact on not just the fitness fashion scene, but the entire fashion industry as a whole. And it all started with Gymshark. Well, it didn't literally start with Gymshark as they weren't the first athleisure brand to step on the scene, but they did it the best, and in the process turned their brand into an international movement with the use of influencer marketing, incredible advertising, and a focus on stylish apparel. Well known among the entire fitness industry as an athleisure titan, and boasting a logo as recognizable as Nike or Under Armour, at least among gym goers, Gymshark took over the fitness industry almost a decade ago, and continues to be a leader in the athleisure scene to this day. And in this video, I'll be talking about how they got there. Behind every successful company is a visionary willing to take the risks necessary to grow their business. And in the case of Gymshark, this visionary is Ben Francis. Ben Francis was born June 4, 1992, and grew up in Bromsgrove, Worcestershire in the UK. His grandfather's furnace company gave Francis his first taste at what being a business owner is like. Having grown up with an eye for innovation in tech, his first interest was in IT, which led him to his first business venture where he sold car license plates online. My granddad ran his own business, and that business was basically lining furnaces with either brick or ceramic fiber. Now, albeit that is a million miles away from websites, it basically made me really inspired and made me think, oh, do you know what? I want to do my own thing. I want to be in a business that I would like to run myself, if possible. As a teenager, Ben had gotten into fitness, so naturally he would blend his technical knowledge with his passion for fitness by creating two applications, Fat Loss Guide, an app to help you track your meals, and an app called iPhysique, which had a vast library of exercises. Both apps made the top charts in the UK and a few other countries on iOS App Store. Francis also created a social networking website called twotone.com, which got a decent amount of traffic, but not enough to sustain itself long term. After graduating high school in 2010, Ben enrolled in Aston University in Birmingham to study international business and management. At the time, he was a Pizza Hut delivery driver making 5 euros an hour, and it was while working at this job that he would decide to start Gymshark. Within 6 months of the company launching, he quit his Pizza Hut job to focus his time and energy on his new pet project. Gymshark started out as a supplement company in 2011 by Ben and his co-founder Lewis Morgan. More on him later. Ben built the website and they officially incorporated it in 2012. Direct-to-consumer stores were on the rise and so was the new cultural emphasis on health and wellness. And they knew this. Like many startups, the pair had a rocky beginning because they didn't have enough money to buy their own stock, nor could they secure any distributors to help get their products in the hands of consumers, so they decided to drop ship supplies from other vendors. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's essentially when a retailer accepts customer orders without having any stock available. The stock is held by a third party manufacturer, so basically selling another manufacturer's merchandise on your website. They would buy supplements from a friend who worked at USN Supplements, and they would mix the different compounds themselves, which suffice to say was not the proper way to do it, and unsurprisingly, it was getting people completely tweaked out. My farm, uh, I think he was working for USN and he could get cheaper supplements and he was selling them to us, and we were mixing them, we'd go and bought powders and mixing them, but obviously- What, that's mixing what, each supplement? Yeah, so we'd get like the beta alanine, the, the caffeine, um, the creatine, and we were just getting scoops and mixing them, but that's not how you yeah, no, mix that's definitely not supplements. How, yeah. so we were giving them to our friends, and mm. one, they didn't go, everyone was being sick, and two, they were, we were putting far too much caffeine oh, and stuff yeah, yeah, that yeah, what used to put in legally allowed. Bursting out of energy, probably Everyone's just going mad in the gym, running around, we're doing yeah. like six hour sessions. <laughs> At this point, Ben and Lewis were ready to broaden their business and started thinking about venturing into fashion. This was because the supplements weren't selling that well. And they also noticed that there was a high demand for a particular style of gym wear that was hard to get in the UK at the time. Stringer tanks. See, they had made enough money from dropshipping to stock other vendors' brand of clothing, but there was nothing out there that they were genuinely interested in wearing. Nothing that represented them and the fitness enthusiast community as a whole. So they knew that if they started dropshipping stringer tanks, the demand at least in the UK would be there. 
At the time, stringers were trending in America and international shipping was outrageous, so most people in the UK were out of luck until Ben and Lewis provided a solution. The stringer tanks sold significantly better than the supplements, so well in fact that they dropped the supplements altogether to focus on the tanks. See, growing up, Ben had learned to sew from his grandmother, an experience which gave him the confidence to invest in a sewing machine and a screen printer with Lewis and begin designing and creating their interpretation of what fitness wear should be, which was longer, stretchier, and more fitted clothing. They decided to stick with a the logo they already had, which was a strong and bold great white shark flexing. In terms of pricing, they priced everything based on what they would personally pay for it and didn't take any other factors into account, at least in the beginning. This clothing was a representation of what was missing in the athleisure scene. A strong combination of fashion and comfort. See, traditional clothing manufacturers didn't make the best clothing for the proportions of athletic body types, which made finding fashionable and comfortable clothing rather difficult. Prior to Gymshark, the most fashionable gym attire was probably Nike or Under Armour, which made attire more suited for an older demographic, not to mention it was up there in price. Aside from ushering a new wave of gym wear, Gymshark was also about building a community. A community of like-minded people who could bond and grow through their love of fitness and fashion. And Gymshark was going to be the vehicle that would drive that message. Being a small team, every piece of Gymshark clothing was custom made, which would take Ben and Lewis and anyone else who helped hours to do. However, this grueling work didn't feel like work because they genuinely enjoyed every second of building their business, something that Ben documented very well in its early stages. This documentation to me is an indication that Ben knew Gymshark would be big one day, but the magnitude of how big it would truly become was something he nor Lewis definitely weren't ready for, and the rise of Gymshark would officially begin at the Body Power Expo in 2012. Let's go back for a second. In 2012, Ben and Lewis attended the Body Power Expo in Birmingham, which is the biggest health and wellness convention in the UK. They initially wanted to go check out some of their favorite brands, enjoy the event, and see the late Greg Plitt. But while they were there, they noticed that it was missing something from a fashion sense. In terms of clothing, there just wasn't anything there that stuck out to them the way their own brand did. So they immediately knew that they had something special on their hands, and that they absolutely had to showcase Gymshark at the next Body Power convention. They were ready to do whatever it took to get their own booth, reportedly spending the 8 to 10k that it would cost to do that. Now it didn't stop at just securing their own booth for the next convention. No, no, no. Like myself and many of you watching this video, Ben and Lewis loved YouTube, specifically fitness YouTubers. When Ben wasn't working on getting Gymshark off the ground, he was spending hours on end watching creators like Chris Lovato, Jeff Seed, and Lex Griffin just to name a few. This makes a lot of sense considering Ben was very in tune with the fitness industry on social media and was heavily inspired by some of the industry's OG influencers. It was this inspiration that motivated him and Lewis to send free Gymshark products to their favorite athletes and popularize what we know today as influencer marketing. Prior to Gymshark, no other brand in the athleisure space was leveraging the popularity of social media influencers and their massive followings. But Ben's desire to do this didn't initially come from a marketing perspective, but from a personal one. He wanted his favorite influencers to check out Gymshark and give him some feedback. And when they actually did, it was a huge deal for Ben and Lewis. Um, Matt Ogus, Chris Lovato, uh, Jeff Side, Lex, Alan, just watch them all the time. And as massive fans, we decided to send them the Gymshark product. Lex Griffin was actually the first influencer to receive Gymshark product, and he reviewed it and gave his feedback and impressions. This essentially was the beginning of influencer marketing, but at the time, the term influencer wasn't even mainstream yet. This step was massive towards getting Gymshark some much needed brand awareness. Now, another breakthrough happened for Gymshark at the end of 2012 when they designed the Lux Fitted Tracksuit, which was the first piece of product they didn't have to physically create themselves. Based on how they look and felt, they knew that these tracksuits were going to be an absolute game changer in the athleisure scene. It was quickly becoming clear to Ben and Lewis that they were on the cusp of something great. At the 2013 Body Power Expo, Ben invited some of the same influencers who he sent product to to be in attendance and help promote Gymshark. The idea was that because many of them were American, the people who were fans of them would jump at the opportunity to meet them in person because that would likely be their only chance. Not to mention, seeing the influencers they admired wearing Gymshark would undoubtedly create a psychological association between Gymshark and success because successful and admirable is how they view their favorite influencers and who doesn't want to emulate success. 
Now, at this point, it's important to note that Ben and Lewis had been doing all their business online and behind the scenes, so they hadn't really met many of the supporters in person. But one thing's for sure, at that year's Body Power convention, they were not ready. Because within minutes of the convention doors opening, their stand was flooded with Gymshark fans that couldn't wait to buy product and meet the athletes. According to Ben, that weekend was so insane that two of their friends, Dan and Craig, skipped their college finals to go to Birmingham and help Ben and Lewis out. The stand and then the entry is, was behind our stand and I, what I can only describe as a flood of people, like literally it was like a flood of people just piled onto the Gymshark stand and I'm sort of carrying boxes and there was literally hundreds of people surrounding the stand and I'm having to sort of say excuse me to try and get them out of the way to get the stop to the stand. To say that the expo was a success is a massive understatement because that expo was not only an unimaginable experience for Ben and his team but massive for the Gymshark brand as they sold out of everything and got people to see their favorite influencers wearing Gymshark in person. During that weekend Ben had turned the stock down on the website since him and Lewis would have their hands full at the expo keeping the influx of orders managed enough for his dad and brother to handle while Ben was gone. When Ben returned home from Birmingham, he turned the stock back on for their other products and released the Lux track suits on their website. And the traffic was so insane, the website could barely handle it. They sold more product in 30 minutes than they had in the entire history of the company, $60,000 worth to be exact. The Gymshark brand had finally made it, and all the work that Ben and Lewis had put in was finally paying off. See, they always knew that Gymshark was bound to take off. It was just a matter of time. Over the course of the next few years, they went on an Expo World Tour, creating and selling more of their favorite products while getting the Gymshark brand seen all across the world, a marketing strategy that would sow the seeds for Gymshark to become a globally recognized brand. Okay, now at this point in the video, we haven't talked a lot about Lewis Morgan and his personal story or his exact involvement with Gymshark. But that doesn't mean that he didn't play a major role in the building of the company, because he did. He was right there with Ben, helping design, create, and market Gymshark. Unfortunately for the pair, they had somewhat of a falling out when Lewis allegedly walked away from his role as a director in the company in 2014. I say allegedly because the exact time frame is only according to Ben, but Lewis vehemently denies this. Because that's, that's what you need, right? You need clear roles and responsibilities. Um, and. Listen, regardless, if you don't have that, it just it just muddies the water, doesn't it? I know I know when Lewis left in 2014, 2015, the, the, the six months after that was difficult. No, Jim Shark. Ben done a recent podcast with Stephen on Diary of a CEO, and he stated in that podcast, I watched the full thing as well, he stated um, that you had left the company in 2014, and he said it was due to you guys having different visions. So, yeah, I started. He wants to say we had different visions, yeah. but if he wants to clear his own conscience by making himself believe that, then by all means. I'm not having Ben going on people's podcasts telling people that I left in 2014, because it's not true. He went on the most recent podcast with Stephen and he mentioned that I left in 2014, which is completely not true. Mm. Check on Company's House, as I said, I resigned as a director in 2016. He feels that stating that he left earlier is an attempt to minimize his overall involvement. When asked about why he left Gymshark, there's a lot that Lewis can't talk about due to legal reasons, but it's very clear that there was some turmoil behind the scenes and some differences in terms of the direction of the company, which can explain why Lewis eventually sold all his shares and washed his hands of Gymshark altogether. I'm not going to go into too much further detail on why Lewis Morgan departed from Gymshark in this video, because I feel like his story and his involvement in building Gymshark deserves its very own video, which will follow this one. But in terms of the mark that Lewis left and his place in the history of Gymshark, it's been pretty clear based on the research that I've done that he's been slowly phased out of the company's history and been made a footnote in the Ben Francis story. Which from a business sense I can understand because he's no longer a part of the company, but from a sentimental standpoint, it's a little sad to see. Despite Lewis leaving, it was full steam ahead for Ben and the rest of his team that had grown significantly, I might add. In 2015, he stepped down as CEO due to his lack of qualification, a decision that was very difficult for him to make. However, stepping down as CEO would allow Ben to improve on his strengths in other areas of the business and allow someone who was more qualified to lead the company. And that person was Steve Hewitt, who had previously worked for Reebok. One thing that I like about Ben and his team is that they were never complacent. 
In 2016, they were named UK's fastest growing company by the Sunday Times, and it was for really good reason. They never let the rapid success they were experiencing cause them to cruise, because they knew the direction that they wanted to take the company would require persistent forward thinking and innovation. So for Ben to recognize that someone else being CEO was best for the long-term success of the company was key to Gemstruck being able to sustain its momentum. According to Ben, one of the key aspects of maintaining a successful business is putting the right people in the right roles while also being as creative with the back end of your business as you are with the front end. Their innovation and desire to grow the community led to them expanding into what would eventually become the most lucrative aspect of their business, women's wear. The women's line was not a hit initially, but eventually began to pick up some steam. They signed their first female athlete, Nikki Blackader, who at the time was one of the fastest rising influencers on the scene, and their women's line would begin to soar after that. Aside from just tapping in with the female demographic, Gymshark made a great effort to mirror what they did with the men for the women, which was create product that women would genuinely like to wear. So having Nikki join the team was a huge advantage to Gymshark, as now they had someone who had a strong female support base, which could allow men in the team to know exactly the kinds of products that women were looking for. Combine that with the constant research they were doing to improve their women's product, and boom, they had a gold mine on their hands. The idea behind Gymshark's inception as a company made even more sense for women's wear because comfort and style is something that the female demographic constantly looks for, especially in athleisure. This is evidenced by the success of Nikki Blackader's first Gymshark collection in 2017. For the unveiling of this collection, there was a pop-up in New York where fans would get to meet Nikki and check out the new collection, and it was so successful that the line to get in wrapped around the block. The collection represented everything that Gymshark had been about and asserted their dominance in the female market. They were not only making clothes that women could feel sexy and confident in, but they were ahead of the curve in all facets of women's athleisure, style, material, comfort, and practicality. It's no wonder why two-thirds of their revenue comes from women's wear, and also not a surprise that their leggings sell better than anything else on their website. Even though they are some of the most expensive products on their website, the demand is and has always been there, mainly due to what I call Booty popping technology. Yes, all of you ladies who are loyal Gymshark customers know exactly what I'm talking about. With respect to Gymshark leggings, they managed to popularize a means of manufacturing women's leggings in a way that accentuates the glute region to really make it pop. And the raised contour on the back here, down the middle of your cheeks, they actually help to suck the material in a little bit. For me, I need that little bit of help and when you have a highly compressive legging, it could kind of make you look like a pancake booty. And that's what, normally, that's what happens to me. But because they thought ahead and added that little raised seam contour, doing your girl some good here. Essentially, if you didn't have a butt, Gymshark leggings could basically give you like a temporary one. And if you did have a butt, <laughs> well. Daddy, chill. This, of course, became a big part of the success of their leggings, among all their other products. I mean, if we take a look at their women's Gymshark Instagram page, which has 2.2 million followers, the description says never skip a leggings day. What also helped grow the Gymshark brand was gym selfie culture, because as Instagram became more and more popular, it became extremely common for people to showcase themselves wearing their favorite clothing brands, the same way their favorite influencers would. Which was even better for Gymshark because they essentially had a bunch of people, some of whom had large followings in their own right, marketing their products for free and giving them free promo. This created a massive chain reaction of people who didn't know about the brand getting exposed to it, and in the process, not just creating this massive brand awareness, but this massive movement that gave the fans a sense of belonging. A movement so large that huge names in all aspects of fitness got involved, whether it be social media influencers, powerlifters, or bodybuilders. As a matter of fact, Gymshark signed its first Sikh athlete by the name of Bayant Kaur, demonstrating its inclusivity with regards to how they've been building their community. In 2018, Gymshark built their state-of-the-art headquarters in Solihull, UK, moving from their former office in Redditch. In 2019, they opened up a new 8,000 square foot office in Hong Kong and built the Gymshark Lifting Club at their headquarters in Solihull. Hi, underscore, is Dave Natty. Well, Matthew, I very much am extremely natty, as a matter of fact. Stop the cap! <laughs> Stop the cap right now! Stop the cap! You know, a good example of somebody who I think is a, you know, like a fake natural as of recent is this guy called David Laid. And as you guys know, fake natties are people who take steroids and claim that they don't. You know, I didn't watch any of his content, I didn't follow him, I didn't really know who he was, so I said, hey, you know, there's a chance he might be natural, I don't know. But now that I've sunk my teeth in, got in deep on this guy, my man Matt 
works for Gymshark. Like, do you need any more reason than that? Athletes are meant to be representatives of what Gymshark's values are all about. These are Ben Francis' words. And I'm saying this because influencer marketing didn't always have the intended impact that it was supposed to. There were some negative implications as well. Let me elaborate. Teenagers were and have been a big part of Gymshark's target demographic for as long as the company's been around. But where Gymshark's been criticized has been the influence of their influencers, if that makes sense. Many of their athletes, specifically their fitness models, have physiques that are not a realistic representation for what is attainable for a young demographic. The big reason why some of these physiques are unrealistic is because many Gymshark athletes and influencers alike have used steroids to build and maintain them, which is expected considering the industry they're in. When being in shape is a big part of what drives your income, you're going to do whatever it takes to sustain that. The problem becomes the impact that that has on the young fans. A lot of these kids don't understand the concept of muscle maturity and the science behind properly using anabolics. They see their favorite Gymshark athletes and want to look like them, so they start exploring every option. Even worse, they see Gymshark athletes that are around their age who likely take some from a PED and become more comfortable with the idea, without having a good understanding of the various long-term negative effects that it can have on your body. He's from Sweden! And he's 18 years old right now, and he's 5 foot 10 inches, He's currently about 190 pounds. He made an insane transformation, mind-blowing, incredible, out of this world, super duper impressive transformation. That's impressive. It's not natural. You're thinking, but yeah, but maybe it is. Okay, here's the thing. This guy became not natural at a very early age. Former athletes such as Ryan Casey and Dylan McKenna have both openly admitted to using SARMs and PEDs respectfully, which is commendable due to the honesty, but also a bit alarming due to how many easily impressionable people could have been influenced into prematurely jumping into that stuff, rather than consistent nutrition and dieting to maximize their natural genetic potential over time. So as great as influencer marketing has been from a business aspect, its social impact has been pretty subjective, let's just put it that way. Because in my opinion, social media influencers, specifically the ones in the fitness industry, have been a part of the leading cause in the rise of body dysmorphia among young people. Balance to health and fitness, applicability, realistic, naturally achievable goals, and all that is not the image and lifestyle that they project to their millions of adoring fans who want to be them. Longevity is just a word in the dictionary and honesty and transparency just an afterthought. In an attempt to combat this, Gymshark has made a concerted effort over the years to showcase models who have more realistic and inclusive body types all over their website and social media pages, which I think they've done a fantastic job of. Now, the scrutiny doesn't stop there though, because with the Gymshark athlete title comes assumed credibility. People will naturally assume that all these athletes know exactly what they're doing and have enough knowledge to disperse practical fitness advice, which some definitely do, but some don't as well. So over the last couple of years, like I went to Gymshark a few times about something that was really bothering me, and that's that I was getting so many DMs and emails of people who'd been put on really low calorie diets by other Gymshark sponsored athletes, being told things that weren't scientifically backed, by other Gymshark sponsored athletes. And they were just being told things that just went completely against like the literature in sports science and in nutrition, and that could be really damaging to their health. And that really bothered me. Many of these athletes got signed, not because of how many certs they have or how many clients they've transformed, but because of how good they look and how well they can market themselves. From a business perspective, that's all that matters. From a realistic perspective, you create an environment where these influencers can use the naivete of their fan base to profit from them. Now, I'm not saying that this is exclusive to Gymshark athletes, but some of their athletes who have participated in this type of predatory behavior definitely created a bit of a stigma with the Gymshark athlete title. As of 2020, the company had 125 influencers on their payroll and most certainly have even more today. Names such as David Laid, Steve Cook, and Nikki Blackheader have been instrumental in the growth of Gymshark and continue to rep the brand to this day. Because according to Ben, Everything we do always starts with culture first and personality first. In August of 2020, General Atlantic, a global growth equity firm, entered a strategic partnership with Gymshark by purchasing a 21% stake in the company, which officially gave Gymshark a valuation of over $1 billion. 
Ben Francis retained a stake of over 70% and his net worth increased significantly to over $730 million. This partnership was Gymshark's first effort to fundraise and it put the company on the track to expand and reach even greater heights if that's even possible. According to General Atlantic, Gymshark is projected to hit a valuation of over $200 billion by 2025. In August of 2020, Ben Francis resumed his role as CEO of Gymshark, citing his knowledge and growth over the years, putting him in a position where he was finally ready. They currently plan on unveiling its first ever brick and mortar store on Regent Street in London in the summer of 2022. This store will also serve as a hub for events, on-site classes, and feature workouts. They've also been recently focused on expanding in the United States, opening an office in Denver, Colorado. The goal now for Ben is to make Gymshark UK's answer to Nike and Under Armour, and based on the trajectory of the company, they're well on their way. He cites the success of Jaguar and Range Rover as huge inspirations for him because of what those brands represent at England, and he wants Gymshark to have that kind of impact. Gymshark placed major emphasis on staying connected to their demographic and consumers while consistently staying on top of their fashion needs as they changed. They thought to leverage social media influencers to build their brand in a mutually beneficial way before anybody else did. They connected with their target demographic and excluded everybody because they realized they would be the ones to carry the Gymshark community into the future. I mean, during a 2015 Black Friday sale, tons of customers got screwed out of being able to make purchases. So what did Ben do? He wrote 2,500 personal apologies to them, including discounts, basically retaining those customers for life. Because what consumer wouldn't appreciate that kind of gesture from the CEO of one of their favorite companies? Gymshark were the pioneers of athleisure and continue to run strong even to this day. But in my personal opinion, they definitely don't have the chokehold on the market that they used to because Alphalete, Lululemon, and other brands have caught up to them and saturated the market, giving customers way more options than they've ever had. But the beautiful thing about the athleisure scene is there's no brand loyalty. We love having options and diversifying our closets, so we'll continue to buy Gymshark, as well as all the other alternatives that have certain products that Gymshark doesn't have because each brand is unique in their own right. And many of these brands were birthed from a movement, a movement created by visionaries who wanted to create a community of like-minded people, just like Ben and Lewis. And that is the reason why all of these other brands have become so successful in spite of Gymshark being ahead. They each have their own massive community. This communal aspect is also the reason why Ben Francis doesn't fear competition from Nike or any other major brand because the lane that Gymshark has created is a lane that Nike and Under Armour just can't fit into and I don't think they ever will. When you think of athleisure, you think of Gymshark. And that's why, more likely than not, they will expand beyond athleisure to become one of the world's biggest fashion brands overall. It's only a matter of time. If you're a Gymshark stan, please get in the comment section and let me know how long you've been repping Gymshark and what the brand means to you. If you like this video, consider giving it a like. If you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell so you know when I drop my next video. I'm Large Kofi. Thank you for watching. However, you dealt with a hand, and ultimately that's the hand that you've got to play. And I think if you really take time to focus on self-development and improvement, I think you'd be very surprised as to the incredible gains that you can make.